Uh, okay, so let's uh, start uh, today class uh, and uh, today we are talking uh, more about mm. Mm. do you see the screen do you see the slides yeah mm, great okay so uh we are talking about i mean one thing that is uh very important in data science are uh, natural language processing and information extraction from and today we are talking more about this. Uh, first, we talk about some kinds of uh, natural language processing and some background about it. We talk about how we can, uh, uh, we talk about some softwares uh, that you can uh, use it uh, using the Python packages that these are good for natural language processing. Uh, also, we are talking mainly how can we represent a document, which is a I mean, essentially like HTML or actually the words even by vectors. And vectors are some mathematical concepts which are very useful. And nowadays this is the state of the art. Like anything that you have it, they are embedding it into some uh, space, uh, Euclidean or similar space. And uh, everything will, be some sort of mathematical concept that will be used. This is the way essentially that machine learning, especially for this uh, NLP stuff works. So natural language processing, we call it uh, NLP. Uh, great. So these are some excellent source, uh, resources. If you want to know more about natural language processing, you can have actually a few courses, undergrad or graduate courses on natural language processing. So we cannot cover everything, but we try to give you some ideas about the things that currently is done and why the process is hard and you have some ideas about it. And we say some of the softwares there. So this is the uh, this is the course on natural language processing by uh, Dan uh, uh, Jarofsky and uh, Chris Manning. That's a good one. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the natural language processing uh, NLP toolkit. That is also a good book. And there are some of these slides that I took it uh, I mean, from uh, John Dickerson and Amal Deshman, they're all professors at, uh, both of them are professors at University of Maryland. Uh, great. Um, so uh, let's uh, start with some history on natural language processing. Uh, the first one, probably it is relevant, is the Turing imitation game, which is back in 1950. So here there are uh, two persons, person A and person B, uh, both of them, they are going into separate rooms. Then the guests are coming and sending questions in. And uh, actually uh, read, the, uh, read the answers here. Read the answers that come out, but they don't know who has given this answer. Here in some sense, it is the imitation. What's the meaning of imitation is that the person A wants to imitate person B, like wants to answer anything uh, that like the same way that person B answers or vice versa, person B wants to do it for person A. So this is the game, uh, Turing's imitation game. Uh, this is actually very relevant because and, uh, nowadays, this kind of A and B, in some sense, B would be human. Uh, so B would be the human. And A would be this kind of the, uh, essentially the ML algorithms or a computer essentially, in general, more generally. So this computer try to imitate uh, B. 
And so this game was 1950 that two people wanted to do that. But here, actually, the main question is that how come a, pers a computer imitate a person? And this is a very interesting question. And still, we are dealing with the challenges related to this. Uh, so now some history about uh, like natural language processing. Some of the early one was they make some kind of mechanical translation it started in 1930. This is based on the dictionary lookups. So you have some from this language to another language, and you will just take uh, uh, any words and try to find the equivalent in the other language and do that. This was done by some uh, Georgetown IBM. That was in uh, 1954. In particular, uh, they translated more than 60 Russian sentences to English. Uh, it becomes a uh, highly publicized but the system at the end did not work well. And because of that, funding dried up in the mechanical translations. So is that the people, the government or others, they didn't believe that actually we can do a good job. So they forget about it, at least until 98. So in, in especially pre-1980, lots of this type of thing was based on sets of hand-toned rules. So in some sense, you decide that if somebody asks these questions, I should answer it this way. And you have some kind of if and only if things that if this is the type of question that I will answer it like that, very naive way. This is some example of that. Um, uh, Eliza, which is the computer traffic. Uh, and you can see this is actually a DOS environment. So, uh, after 1980, actually, lots of things happened. In particular, uh, this was the concept of uh, machine learning that are used to NLP or natural language processing. Initially, decision trees uh, have been used uh, to understand, I mean, essentially, what is this and what if a sentence is like that, what should be the answer automatically. Uh, there are some kinds of uh, hidden Markov models has been used for uh, part of a speech tagging. We will talk about it later in this, what is the POS. And lots of statistical models for languages are mm, has been obtained. And there are uh, some uh, recent work on uh, like more recent work on the uh, purely unsupervised or semi-supervised learning. So essentially the case that the supervised learning, we know what is the input, what is the output in supervised learning, unsupervised learning, we don't uh, know what should be the correct output in some sense. Uh, and nowadays, actually, probably since uh, around after 2010, around that time, Deep learning has largely taken over. And we talk about it uh, today uh, on that as well. So then the deep learning has largely taken over and we talk about some of the techniques in this session. Uh, also in this course, uh, earlier in this course, we talk about some of the, uh, we used the requests and beautiful soap, for example, to scrape a structured data from the web. Uh, here, there are lots of data that come as unstructured free text, like Facebook posts, Amazon reviews, WikiLeaks dump. And here, the job of data science is that to get some kinds of meaningful information from this free text, unstructured text. And the main problem here is that we need, or the main challenge is that how can we understand somehow this uh, text? You need to understand it at some level such that we can do some meaningful job out of them. So to just give you some ideas about understanding that how understanding the language can be hard, or I will say very hard. Let's see this sentence. One morning I uh, shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got into my pajamas, I'll never know. I mean, you don't know this text, you will get it. You don't know what it refers to, or is it a joke or it is a real thing? 
it's a hard thing essentially. You may try to understand and parse it, but parsing it in some sense to know the syntax of it, that might be easier. But the semantics of that, uh, so syntax means what are the ordering of that? What are the different verb or other things? These are not trivial, but you can do it. But the semantics means meaning of this sentence, meaning of this document. That's the hard things that we need to do. So even a simpler thing. So for example, this is the one that uh, suggested this uh, uh, <laughs> test um, by uh, Levesco. It was a complement uh, to Turing test. So it says that, like, just see the sentences. Uh, can we pick out the uh, antecedent of an ambiguous, uh, ambiguous uh, pronoun? For example, here you just say the city councilman uh, refused the demonstrator, uh, re refused the demonstrators a permit because they violence. So the question is that they this day is refers to demonstrators or goes to councilman. It's not a trivial thing, and actually Levesco argues that understanding these sentences requires more than NLP. It needs some common sense reasoning and deep contextual uh, understanding of this text, such that we can see whether they re refers to demonstrators or councilmen, even for these simple things that you want to pick out the antecedent of an uh, ambiguous pronoun. Uh, great. These are like some other examples. You can see it uh, from this. These are, you can read this one. I don't want to go through all of them and read it, but you can see that the first one is uh, talking about some games and it talks about, uh, I mean, some pixel masterpiece. And the other one is talking, and uh, apparently it was a good game. This other one was a bad game. And it's talking about something that it's not clear actually whether it is about the game, whether it, it is about politics or what. And you can get some uh, sentiment that, oh, it is a, about good things versus bad things, but you really don't understand what's going on. Another thing is this one, uh, Trump's uh, new travel ban blocks uh, migrants from six nations sparing Iraq. You can read this text, uh, it is in the slides. And uh, the question is that when you read it, this is, you should, I mean, a machine should understand or a computer should understand. It is about sports, about political, about a dark comedy. And what entities are covered? Are they covered with positive or negative sentiments? Or what other signals that we can get out of this? So it is even this text, I mean, is talking about the, talks about immigration, it talks about the new order, uh, about banning some people. Uh, so it's like, you don't know whether it is about religion or what. And there are lots of things there. And these are like complicated texts. So, so far we mentioned that actually understanding the things, it, it may look simple, but it is not simple at all because it can be this, in some sense, I will mention actually to students that writing is a part is kind of art actually, and it is art. These are like a great writers that we have or we had, and writing is an art. It means that you are thinking a lot and you will put those things in wordings. And now, computer should understand what is the meaning of that. In some sense, it needs to read the brain of the people. This, this might not be the case for all texts, but some texts can be essentially a masterpiece and it might be very hard to understand. Anyhow, so now that we talk about uh, those hardness issues or those challenges, let's talk about, uh, I mean, some basic things. We talk about, uh, just let's talk about first. The terms are some kinds of individual words separated often by white space or punctuation. This is a term that we are talking about it. Then after that, we have documents. Documents are a group of free texts. So uh, 
like for example, a uh, New York Times article, a journal paper, entries in a table, like especially in for this uh, NoSQL type of data, that can be, I mean, some text that we have it, and it's a document. And finally, we have a corpus. Corpus is a collection of documents. Oh, so a lot of documents, like you can consider documents, HTMLs, which are on the web, or XMLs, which are on the web, or uh, chapters of a book, or something like this. So it is a collection of documents. So in some sense, uh, 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 corpus, has several uh, documents. And the document has uh, lots of terms. So some of type of NLP task that we want to talk about it. So if we talk about it is like NLP, some history about it, why they are hard, understanding these sentences are not that easy. Now, uh, we need to, when we have the languages, we have uh, two things that we need to do. One is the syntax. Syntax is the one essentially how the words are coming in order and understand some roots of the individual words. That's generally an easier task. It's not a trivial one, but an easier task. So one of the important one is the tokenization. So what is a tokenization? You are trying to splitting a sentence into tokens. That's one thing. Then after that, we have a lemmatization and a stemming. So uh, what is the lemmatization and a stemming? We generally try to, for example, turning organi organizing and organize into organize. So this, we try to get a stem or root of the things. It is very similar also to the next step, which is called uh, morphological segmentations, that you are essentially getting a, a word or a token, you try to organizing, it is organized plus ing, and it might be easier for English, but for some other language might be much harder. Another thing which is important is the part of a speech, POS tacking. So that's essentially means uh, under some standard way, decide whether a word or a token is a noun, is an adverb, is a verb. So in some sense, you will consider this word uh, and uh, this word that you are doing individually, you try to first you get all the tokens and then you try to understand what are the stem or root of them? What, what are, this has been formed out of which parts and whether it is a noun, adverb, verb, etc. And of course, we try to parse it also to understand so this is the, for example, this is a noun, this is the verb, a verb should come at the end, the noun should come at the beginning, and this type of thing that we try to parse it. So this is a syntax, not trivial, uh, but much easier than semantics. Uh, semantics is the harder part. Especially, I mean, there are several applications and the tasks that we are doing using semantics. Semantics means meaning of the sentence or meaning of the words or meaning of a document. Meaning means you should understand the person who has written it. If it's not an automatic one that nowadays exists, uh, then in that case, what are these meaning? What was the in the brain of that person? And one information, one which is very important is this kind of individual extractions. So what is uh, IE or information extraction is that you have some unstructured web text, for example, uh, and this is the one that you get it from the web. And from this, you need to get it into a structured sequence. In particular, you should be able to answer some questions. Uh, for example, you will read it. The second sign of uh, Zodaic is uh, Tartus. You will say that the sign of Zodaic is uh, Arius, then second is Tartus, and the other one is Gemini uh, or Gemini. Uh, so, uh, the other questions for the other thing. So you will just read some sentences, some text, and you need to be able to answer it. A good example of that is nowadays essentially at Google. At Google search, now you are doing such kind of searches. You are asking like, what is the meaning of 
semantics of a language. You can have this one and actually brings you the best answer for that. This is exactly the thing that it goes through all these web pages and try to understand that one and give you the best answer for it. So these are the type of generally the questions and you need to get from this whole this website, you can get some interesting thing for that. It, it, but uh, generally, I want to go a little bit more into information uh, extractions. Uh, so uh, generally, we try to get, uh, I mean, some relevant part of some text. We will take them, and then we will get it from lots of documents. So in, that, in some sense, the way that Google is doing that, or I think Bing also is doing somehow that. Uh, so uh, you try to find, when you ask question, you try to find some kind of limited relevant parts of the text. And then this gathers this information from many pieces of the text. And then try to, uh, so get essentially the relevant from each text and then from lots of text. And then you try to produce a structured representation of the relevant information. Uh, what can be that? I mean, one important thing is the relations in the database sense. So from this one, you try to create some tables in some sense, or is some uh, uh, knowledge base. So uh, the main goal is that we should, from this data, we try to get some information which is useful for people. And at the same time, we can put it, uh, this information in some form, for example, in some kinds of, uh, relations or other things that we can uh, have further inferences uh, generally made by computers. So it is useful both for people and for computers. And that's the generally means the information extraction. It's a very important task. And this is essentially Google is master of it, or I think Bing also is becoming better on that. And uh, that's a very important one that like at some point the Google was you were just searching about a word or two words. Here you can ask questions from Google and that actually answers you. So the, the computers become smarter and smarter in this one. Uh, so uh, generally about this information extraction, as I mentioned, they try to create some kind of relations in terms of database, like a table. Generally, they need to, uh, need to this system need to say who did it, what did it, who has done it or when it has done it or to whom he has done it. And here, these are some information, some examples, for example, gathering earnings, profit, board members, headquarters, by reading some information about a company. For example, when you read this sentence, uh, the headquarters of PHP, uh, Billiton Limited and the global headquarters of the combined PHP Billiton group are located in Melbourne, Australia. And then this should understand that the headquarters of this uh, is a, for this company is the, in Melbourne, Australia. You can consider it like essentially some kind of relational database or key value databases. Uh, or Understand, for example, the drug genes product interactions from a medical research literature. So read that and say, what is the, uh, inter so what is, if you do this one, what is this drug has the effect on the genes, et cetera, the interaction between. And as I mentioned, uh, this type of things, uh, also we have this, uh, so at Google, uh, we have two versions of that. We have one version that you get actually the actual information extraction when you're asking Google some questions. Uh, but also there are other cases that uh, doing it more low level. Low level, you don't need to understand the whole things, but you can suggest some interesting thing. For example, here, if you go to your Gmail, you will see that. Uh, so you said that uh, this board of directors is having a pot like dinner Friday, January 6th. Here, it is essentially highlights this one. And you, if you bring mouse on that, it's like, uh, should I create a calendar event for that? And uh, some of this might be easier based on regular expression and the name list that we discussed. So, like, if it's, uh, these are easier to understand, that understanding the whole things and answer the whole. Uh, 
yeah, this is uh, some of the things that as I mentioned Google is doing. And Google is like, I think this slide maybe is a bit older one, but nowadays you can even ask questions from Google and gives you the answers for that. But even this, even the low level one is not that easy because if you just see this website, for example, it seems a regular website, but here you should understand that this one, English books, antiques, uh, 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 antiques and the toys. And here you should understand this is a, a book, not a toy. And for example, from this information, you should understand that this is the title of the book and this is the price of the book. Getting all this information is still more easier. I will say this is somehow we have we discuss about the syntax. And then we talk about the semantics. So as I mentioned, syntax is easier. It's not trivial, it's, it's easier than semantics. And here in some sense, this is the IE and a low level ID means that, I mean, you will, it's a bit more than syntax, but it's still not at the level of semantics in terms of hardness. Uh, another task that we are doing, for example, if we understand the semantics is to identify key entities in a text. For example, you will read this in a text and you want to say that these are the entities, for example, 1917 or Einstein, or I don't know, Franklin Roosevelt, Manhattan, and these entities that is talking about. Uh, so uh, this is interesting. So in some sense, these are the one, I mean, some of you, you may have passed GRE. And in GRE, in some sense, when you try to read a text, you may have a limited time to understand the important information. And this is one other things that you may do similarly there. But of course, if they can, computers can do it, they, they have a better understanding. What are the key entities about this? This is again, it is important in the information uh, extraction because if somebody asks about Einstein, you say, oh, this document might be relevant. And maybe actually he said that Einstein was uh, affiliated with uh, Institute for Advanced Study, also known as IIS in Princeton. That's actually interesting things that this document may have it. But first we need to understand what are the entities, especially Einstein, which is here. Another thing which is uh, very useful is uh, in, if when we understand it about text classifications. So here is that when we have some text, some document, we want to classify the topic or the theme of this document. So it is one very important application about spam filtering. So you just get an email and all of this software that they are getting emails, for example, Google, Gmail, or others. And they need to understand whether this is a, a spam or the real thing. So understanding what is the type of this, is it a real email or is it a spam? That's the important one. Uh, the other thing is that uh, language identification, you want to say which language is that? That is also not a trivial thing. Uh, some other things, uh, like for example, a genre classification. You want to see what is the genre of this fictional story? Can we just understand it? Another one, which is very important, sentiment analysis. We talk more about it. This is especially important for advertisement uh, and a ranking type of things, rating or ranking. So uh, what type of document is this? I mean, is it, is it a deed or? I don't know, is a paper, is an article, what is it? When was this uh, document written? This might be, I mean, some might be easier, might be hard. Uh, some readability assessment, whether it is written well or it is not written well. How can we understand that one? Or another interesting thing is the author identifi uh, identification. What is this about author identification? Is that, for example, you can see this, the Federalist paper, and then you see from that, can you understand who are the uh, uh, authors of this papers or this, this is a non-trivial. Or this, this is other example that you can go. And these are some of the tasks that when we talk about text classifications are important. Again, we need to understand this one from the semantics or meaning of these sentences. Uh, that's uh, another example that I want to talk about it is about the sentiment analysis. And that's actually a very important one. 
one particular thing. You can consider it as a text classification, but maybe it is more important. Just the semantics uh, sentiment analysis by itself is very important. So this is especially important for the ad industry, advertisement industry, and say you get some reviews or opinion. You want to see whether they are positive or negative. This is a very good example. So uh, say if I don't give this part that what is the rating, an extremely uh, versatile machine. That is the one that is written by this guy. And say, I don't say give you this a score. Then the issue is that whether this is a positive thing or negative. So extremely versatile machine seems uh, it's a good thing. <laughs> but you can just read this one. This guy actually bought a coffee maker. And he has actually written nicely. Again, this is some kinds of art that he has done it. He essentially wants to say that this uh, coffee maker is doing everything except making a good coffee. And in that sense, it is an extremely versatile machine. But you can read the sentence, and it is not uh, uh, um, like you can just, I mean, it's not clear at all whether it is a positive things or not. For example, just reading this last one, I mean, you can read the rest uh, uh, yourself. But say, uh, this is the interesting one. Uh, if faced with the choice between having a car, having a car door repeatedly slamming into my ex and buying this coffee maker, I unhesitantly choose the this coffee maker. Uh, I think this is the things. The coffee would be lousy, but at least I would still have children. So this is like, you can see, this is like <laughs> things the person has written. It is uh, it's nicely written, and, but it's completely non-trivial that whether it is a positive one or negative one. Of course, not everything is like that, but handling such kind of extreme cases would be very interesting. Another thing, when we understand the meaning, of course, the machine translation that we already talked about it, we want to translate from one language to others. And generally, we talk about it, there was such kind of thing by the searching the dictionary or substitution of words, uh, like from the dictionary or even a few sentences, like the closed words from the dictionary that does not work. Really, you need to understand it and put the, so you read something, you will understand it and you will put it in the new text. And for example, if this is the input sequence, I don't know, in Chinese, uh, then these are some of the translations in different languages that you can uh, see it. And it takes time actually to get something meaningful out of it. It's one of the hard jobs as well. Uh, good. Uh, yeah, and I mean, this is another, uh, Example, I mean, you can say, uh, 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 yeah, these are some of these languages and some of this translation. And you see, this essentially shows that uh, uh, it can be uh, hard to translate from one language to another one, as you can imagine. Uh, this is uh, from this NLTK book. You can just read it and just, uh, see about the translation. Uh, good. Another question which is very important, in some sense this is related to that information extraction, but you can again mention it as a one party because that information extraction is somehow is just could be low level or a different level. But another thing is the question answering that you want to answer, uh, you answer questions posed uh, by a user with a specific answers. There are even some, uh, like, you know, some contests out of this. And as I mentioned, like, for example, this is some of the questions that you can get it from uh, uh, Wolfram Alpha, or uh, you can get it from Google and it, try to understand it. It's not easy one, like how many calories are in two slices of banana ice cream? Uh, these are, I mean, they need to do some computation, et cetera. And actually Google becomes very good on answering these questions. Uh, uh, yeah. 
So, uh, and these are questions, I mean, can be at the different levels of hardness. You will see that, I mean, uh, for example, somebody may ask like the, a factoid type of question, who wrote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? That might be easier. Or how many calories are there in two slices of apple pie? Then if you have this information that uh, one slice of apple pie, how much has, uh, how much calories has approximately, then you may make it, then you should understand this is two times that, then you should make it times two and you get it. Or the, what is the average age of the onset of autism? Again, this is some information, you should get it from autism and the age, and then you may take the average. Uh, and this, you may have even more complex narrative questions. Uh, so for example, in this particular children with this particular illness, what is the uh, efficacy of uh, astaminophen in reducing fever? That's more harder question to answer. These are, again, you need to understand quite well the language such that you can do it. And this is the one that I mentioned. Uh, Google and I think nowadays others like the Bing and others, they are trying to do that. And they have this, if you are asking questions, sometimes you try to answer it with the first first thing, try to answer it. That's exactly this idea, which is very, which are very useful actually. Uh, the, uh, the other thing is like, this is somehow similar to question answering is that you are given some text and then you want to see there is actually you are given two segment text fragments, one the actual text and the other one. And you want to see whether one being true in tales of the other or in tales of the other's negation or uh, allows to the other to be either true or false. So this is a good example. You can see this is a text that it is uh, mentioned here. Uh, on the huge market potential currently led by Google, this, et cetera. And then from this one, the hypothesis that Yahoo bought uh, Overture. Uh, this actually, you can read it and then from this see whether it is correct or not. You see, it, it is true actually. But similar thing, Microsoft bought Star Office. That is actually false from this. Or Israel was established in May, 1971. It is also, it is something false. Here, I mean, if you if you are not careful, actually, you may claim that it is the case. So these are somehow related to question answering, but it is not quite that. You want to see whether if I have these two takes, whether this one, uh, whether the first one implies the second one or not. Another very important applications of semantics are document summarizations. That's also very important. A good example is the summary, but there are some other ones exist there. And this is also very important uh, things because you will, there are tons of, uh, nowadays there are tons of uh, news or texts that are generated and we don't have time to read all of them. It is very important that if a machine can go and read them and then bring some summary for us such that we can get some ideas out of it. Uh, this is some that you can see it. Uh, I mean, from this text, you get this kind of summary that uh, after Supreme Court later, Apple versus Samsung goes to the forced uh, jury trial. And uh, this is some kind of abstract and it is not an easy thing. Um, like getting a text, you want to get an abstract or a summary of that. There are lots of other tasks, uh, lots of other tasks that these are also relevant uh, if we understand semantics of these sentences, like meaning of these sentences or meaning of the document. Like for example, uh, HP, um, speech recognition, uh, caption generation, natural language generation. These are the ones that actually we are generating some uh, uh, text uh, or optical character recognitions. Uh, so you want to essentially say, what is the, what, this per what does this person says? Or what is the caption for these things? Or, uh, I mean, the word sense disambiguations, and uh, this can be, all of them can be done for different languages. And then also different languages, they have their own challenges as well. They have some structure that might be quite different. So for any language might be different. And this is a, like a great task. And again, as I mentioned, it's a very active field of, uh, machine learning, I will say actually computer science, understanding this NLP and there are, the people get some PhDs to just understand a little bit about this or improve this or understanding or algorithms a little bit about NLPs. 
So that's, uh, and it is somehow, it is also, is not just computer science. It is a social sciences as well, or uh, like language study, because these are like the people are getting just PhD or they are spending their whole life in understanding some particular language, some old language. So it's a very big deal. Uh, but here, of course, we cannot get to everything here. And uh, here we want to somehow simplify the things. Generally, when we have this kind of complicated thing, as I mentioned, this is, you can study the languages forever. And this is not an easy thing that you can uh, do that. One way to do that is trying to do more math and somehow simplify it and make it into mathematics. And uh, believe it or not, that has uh, uh, this kind of uh, abstraction into math was very successful at least in several cases. So we try to understand this one and then essentially uh, consider a document and we try to represent this document uh, by some uh, math things. And then the, the thing that we will talk in the rest of this session about this one, a document or a word, we try to represent it by a vector. And the vector is just array. I don't know if that array of size n would be in some vector in n dimensions. So we try to represent essentially this uh, documents or words or even the uh, corpus into by just some vectors. And these vectors, like from the distance between these vectors or similarities between this vector, like distance from this vector generally, we can get good information. So uh, one easy way, let's start this thing. This, this is like some text and you can actually, there are some software that they are doing that. They will take, get a text from you and they will turn it into some kind of diagram. So here, for example, exchange appeared a lot. So these are mainly based on the, uh, how many, uh, like you say uh, each word, how many times appears essentially in a document. Uh, so uh, like one easy way is that consider each document and just represent it as a vector of word frequency. So for each word, you have one dimensions and you can consider it a dictionary essentially. For each word, uh, you will say, what is the, uh, how many times this word appeared? And this is, would be a vector that we are considering. So in that case, uh, uh, we don't care about the order of the words. We only care about the number of occurrences of a word. And as you can see, for example, this is, uh, I mean, one text that we have it. And uh, this text uh, that we try to represent it with the, it is, this approach is called the bag of words because we have just, we call, take the whole document, we just break down the order and we have say how many uh, from each words we have it. What is the frequency or number of occurrences of each word? That would be the simplest way to do that. Let's see an example here. Uh, so uh, this is an example. So consider these three uh, documents that we have. This is the doc one, doc two, and this is the doc three. Uh, and uh, so sorry, this is actually, yeah. So then you can just represent it. Just say, that, uh, take the, all the words that appear in all of this doc. So in some sense, this is considered the corpus, corpus of these three documents. These are short documents, of course. And so this is the corpus, these are the documents and these are the items or the words essentially, or the token. Uh, Good. Now uh, we just say, uh, we will write all the words and they say how many they appear. So document one had two, the zero, this one and zero U and one quick one dog set. Document two has two U, two he, one I and so on and so forth. And document three has this one. So this is the one that we can represent it like that. So, this is the, uh, uh, let's define some uh, terms. This is actually called term frequency. What is a term frequency? It means, it means the number of times a particular term appears in a specific document. So more formally, TF of 
IJ is the frequency of word J in a document I. So it is TF IJ. So it means that uh, in document I, how many times word J appears? This can be just raw count, like in the bag of words. Of course, like in the bag of words, we just count it. So it can be just count how many times appears. Sometimes you don't care whether 10 times appeared or 20 times, just you care whether it appeared or does not appear. In this case, the TF of IJ would be zero and one, whether it appeared or does not appear. Sometimes we are reducing the effect of outliers. We take the log of this one. Generally, log is a good thing to take it because for example, you may have a word, uh, I mean, I don't know, uh, he. So it may appear in one document really uh, is like, the, it may appear zero times, it might be one time, two times, and then maybe 20 times, maybe 21 times, and then 40 times. When you take the log, that log is very important. Then in some sense, you will see, you want to see there is a difference between one and two. So if the, the word appears zero versus one or one or two, that might be different. So that may have a different meaning between, or the, this one appears between 20 and 21. So 20 and 21, really, this is just a noise here. But maybe zero to one is not the case. It is a very important information. That's the thing that when we take the log, for example, these guys become the same. So zero becomes its own category. One to two would be like one category. And then uh, three to four would be another category. And for example, here 20 until 40, that would be the same category as well, if you get log base two. You will put it at one plus, this because you don't want to have a log of zero. So that's a log generally is a good way. When you have the numbers, the generally the people take the log. This is if you have a, a, like a, some feature that is some numbers, generally the people take it into log n classes uh, where n is the maximum number of this and you just, then you are doing this kind of uh, one hot encoding based on that. We will talk about it. Uh, the one hot encoding a little bit later in this talk. Another approach that is the one, you will take uh, T of uh, TFIJ over max J TIFJ. So you will norm, again, this, these are the typical things that you are doing in any machine uh, learning like uh, model. Either you will say whether the number maybe is not important, zero, one is important. Maybe the number is important, but you want to reduce the outlier and the noise, you will take the log or you will normalize. How do you normalize? You will normalize with documents eyes must frequent word. Always, if you have TFIJ, maybe that's not that important. Maybe just the fact that this uh, document is so long, the number of times that this appears, this particular word appears is so many. So in that takes, you will take that number over the maximum frequency of any word in this document, in this particular document, and that would be the normalized things. And uh, so why it is important? Because these different words that we have it, so we can say, uh, consider this one and these different words. From that, we can actually learn a classifier. What is that? You may give this vector essentially to a uh, machine learning model, and then understand whether the, based on this just number of words and this type of things, you will say that different words, of course. Whether, who is the author of this? Uh, so uh, let's see uh, this particular example. Suppose we are classifying a document, whether it is written by uh, the Beatles or not. So this is a binary classification. It means that zero, not Beatles, one Beatles. So that is the Y. So this Y essentially is the target uh, parameter in some sense or target, target variable. So what is X? Uh, so you will give the, uh, so this is important. In any machine learning things, we will generally give X and Y. And this X for different Xs, we will say what is Y. This is the supervised learning essentially. Y is the target value. And then you will give for some of these different Xs, you will give it. And then for some new stuff, some X prime, Y prime. So for X prime, then you don't know what is Y prime. And this is the predictions that you need to do it. You just give, so you, this is the training part. 
And this is mainly the test part. So you will train for some of this is a supervised, typical supervised learning that you will give all, for each X, you will say, what is the Y, what is the target value? Then you expect that this machine learning model learns about it, this ML algorithm learns about it. And then for some other X prime, which was not necessarily one of these guys before, you want to see what would be Y prime for this case. So here, uh, Y is equal to zero or one, whether it is uh, written by Beatles or not. And then, uh, Uh, here, uh, you can, uh, I mean, train it. For example, you need to say, this one is uh, by Beatles, for example, uh, this is the example. So this is the Y var variable for the first one is zero. So this is the Y variable. This is zero means you have not Beatles. This is by Beatles and the other one zero means not Beatles. So this is the one, this is the, uh, the one essentially, it is a, So you, these are the features of this document, this number of words that appear. You will give these features to a model and the Y, and you just essentially train it as a supervised learning, such that if I give another sentence, then you will tell me whether it is uh, written by Beatles or not. Of course, this is not an easy task to do, but I mean, the people are working on this type of algorithm. If you have a huge text, that might be helpful and you may get something correct out of it. Uh, so, uh, recall this one, uh, as we discussed that TFIJ, so that, that was the application, but let's still understand uh, some of these things, see what is the best approach. Uh, so, we talk about some kind of normalization, take log, but still we want to do a little bit maybe more than that. So generally TFIJ is the frequency of word J in document I. Any issues with that? The main issue is that these terms, <clears throat> term frequency gets overloaded by common words. So it means that there are lots of common words. And generally when you do a machine learning task, you don't, you want to essentially remove these kinds of common things because common thing does not give you any information to you. The special things are the ones that they are giving useful information to you. So you try to kill essentially the common word. The way that you will do it, this is something that is called inverse document frequency. What is the inverse document frequency? It is the weight of individual words uh, Negatively, so we essentially we have a weight of the individual words which are negatively affected by how frequency they appear in a corpus. So that is not just a document about the whole corpus. So what is that? So df of j, j is just a word. So there is no document here. This, you have a, doc, a word in a whole corpus, several documents. How do we compute it? You will compute the number of documents that I have over the number of documents with word j. What is the meaning of that? The, uh, so here, as I mentioned, this IDF, inverse document frequency, it's only defined for word J, not for word document pairs JI. So it is uh, not for word document pair JI, but actually it is a, uh, defined only for a word J. And what does it say? In general, it says that if the number of, you see, if the number of documents, this is the total number of documents. If the number of documents that a word J appeared is very little, these documents over, say if it is one, then this would be a very large number. But if it is a common word, then the number of documents that this word appears probably would be the number of documents. So in that case, actually the, this number becomes one. So let's see this example, uh, in the one that we have done it. You just compute it. So all the logs here are based on E. So here, for example, consider the, uh, the appear in, there are three documents. It's always we have three documents. So all of them are three. So here in these three documents that we have, uh, so uh, the, so the appears in two documents, this guy and this guy. So here, when we get the log of 
three over, then that's the thing that we are computing, log of three over two, which is this number. The uh, other things that we have it is this one. For example, uh, this is uh, this uh, inverse document frequency for the word U. For the word U, there are uh, three documents and word U appears uh, only in document two. So it is three over one, it is this. You see, the is a more common word, so its weight would be lower. U is a just appeared in one time, then the, its value would be higher. The same thing for uh, CMSC 320 that appears, for example, one time out of three times. So the log of based on E would be this. So it means that those uh, words with the uh, like more specialized word appear with higher weights. So this is finally, this is the common things that we are using it for vectorization. So how can we use this IDFs? We are just, uh, uh, this is the, the thing that we are using it, that's important. TF-IDF means term frequency, inverse document frequency. Uh, uh, what's the meaning of that? It essentially means that uh, consider the TF-IJ and just multiply by IDF of J. It, uh, so it means that the words that are very common, their weight will be decreased. Those words that are uh, more, uh, like very special words, their weight would be higher. So for example, here, if you see here, for the IDF of D, D was 0 0.4 and IDF of U was one essentially, or 1 or 1.09. So, uh, and then uh, how many dove we had it here? So we had two, uh, like uh, we had it two da, two times 0 0.4, that is 0 0.8. Here for U, we have two words of U here, and the weight of that is 1.09. That would be 2.2 .2 essentially, that we have it. So in this way, this is actually, this IF, IDF is a very natural way, is like something that the people are using it. Uh, that works better for a scores uh, or the vectorization of documents that we are doing it here. Uh, and this works also better for computing similarity between documents. Uh, so uh, that is a, a very important. And as I mentioned, so we have just the number, the bag of words, plus this other IDF that we are multiplying and it works very well in practice, actually this one. And as, you, as I mentioned, this is the vector that we represent document one. So for us, the document one would be just these numbers that we are considering, these TF IDF numbers. The same thing for document two and document three. Uh, now, a similarity between documents, that's very important. So you have essentially a lot of documents. One thing that is, always we are using it are just some kind of clustering. And to do clustering, you want to see what are the similar documents, because as long as you have some kind of similar documents in uh, somewhere, then you have a one particular word, you want to see it is uh, uh, like, so you are essential, these are all set of documents that you have it in a corpus, then you are just classifying them into several sets. Now, if there is a word that is coming and you understand that, uh, this, like essentially these questions are related to one of these documents in this class, then you will understand, okay, maybe these are all similar documents that you have already pre-computed. So then you will just go and uh, uh, like uh, uh, report uh, like the other answers, or you will go and search through this one such that you can find the solution to this. Another example, for example, is this one. You will go to Amazon, for example, you are searching an item. And when you are doing that, it, uh, if you see that Amazon, there is something called a sponsor. Uh, so what is the sponsored products? A sponsored product, you can think about this one, that, uh, or this is actually some of them are sponsored, some of them are uh, uh, native products. Uh, anyhow, so in both of them, when you are seeing some item, you are, this is called the detail page. So you are seeing something, I don't know, you want to, uh, a particular book, for example, you are seeing that. Now here it shows when you are seeing this book, it, also in the, for example, here, 
it shows some similar books to you. These similar books are actually, are somehow you can consider a book is a document. And if we have the similarity measure, then we can say which books are similar to this book. Then I can show you these other books as well that you might be interested in it. That especially in advertisement or even non-advertisement, this is like some kind of the best seller or best recommendations. These are very important, especially for recommendation system. So anyhow, whenever we have two documents, this is, a, this is, this applies not only for documents for anything. That's the reason that we have the vectorization. Now that we have this text, we have turned it by this way that we discussed into some vectors. Now for two documents X and Y that say they have represented by their TF-IDF vectors and they're, for this guy is A and for this guy is B, then you want to see what is the similarity between these guys. So the similarity is measured by this, A times B times size of A times size of B, which is essentially if you can just, this is the exact formula for that, for the size and dot product. This is called cosine similarity. And it is a, a, a very important. This cosine similarity is one of the best way to consider the similarity between two documents. The idea is that if two, uh, uh, if you consider two vectors, if one vector is on top of the other one, the angle between these two vectors, it does not care that much about the size of these vectors. Why? Because so that maybe this is larger document than this one. So the size maybe is not important. However, if they are aligned with each other, if you just consider the, the angles between this one and the cosine of the angles between these two, things. So this considers these two vectors. And essentially, this is the alpha. It considers the cosine of alpha. Why is it good? Because if these two documents are completely aligned with each other, then the, the angle between them would be 0. In that case, the cosine of this would be 1. It means that these guys are very similar. It might happen that sometimes the angle, the worst case is that the angle between these guys would be essentially just these are just perpendicular to each other, means that the cosine of that would be zero. It means that these guys are not similar. So that actually gives you very good similarity measures between zero and one for the vectors that you have. And it turns out in practice that a similar documents have high cosine similarity. These similar documents have low cosine similarities. Again, cosine similarity always, this is the whole idea. Uh, this is the current trend actually in lots of machine learning that anything that we have it and we talk more about it try to represent it with some vectors vectors are something that some arrays in some sense in some dimensions and then uh, then try to do all of these operations automatically by these mathematical operations so when we talk about similarity between two documents it turns out the mathematical concept for that is, the, is that you should represent these documents by two vectors and then see the angle between these two vectors and then take the cosine of that. That tells you how similar are these. And that actually worked very well in practice. So these are somehow uh, uh, make mathematics out of this kind of natural language processing. Uh, good. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, a few other things as well fast. Then I will go and we will take some break for other things. So regular. So this is mainly essentially for this uh, syntax. So for the syntax, there are some things that we are useful. So one thing is uh, for the syntax uh, generally to understand is the regular expression. Regular expression it will be used to parse essentially a sentence. So for these are, we talked about it before when we talk about the beautiful soap and the setup before. So I, these are like similar to that, maybe not exactly the same format, but very similar. The regular languages are very important. And for example, we talk about it when you write one, two, three, this, this one, it means that any digit or when we write this one meaning any an uppercase and so on and so forth. I don't want to talk about it. We talk about the name group, et cetera, when we talk about this one or digit versus a space versus uh, a white space versus uh, alphanumeric. These are the things we talk about them. I don't want to repeat them. These are very important for the getting the syntax out of it. The other one is the tokenization. 
these are the things that I mentioned again in syntax. They might look simple, but it's not completely trivial. So uh, this is if you want to get any text, the first step is to get the text processed. So for English, you can just maybe spell it on uh, non-alphanumerical characters. Uh, so that's I mean, or like consider the white space, but it is not completely trivial. For example, if you consider I am or Francis or uh, Hovlet uh, Hacker. So uh, then whether it is one word or two words or San Francisco, whether it is one word or one token or two tokens. Uh, this might be uh, for other languages might be much harder. Like for example, in France or in, uh, in uh, if you talk about in uh, French, uh, ensemble is it one token or two tokens or you have like this kind of very long word in germany how do you want to do that or chinese or japanese that would be i'm not very uh, i mean familiar with those languages but there are lots of i mean uh, complications exist there even regarding the white spaces uh, other things that we talk about the limitization, or this is essentially finding the root. So here we try to reduce the uh, variance to the base form. For example, when I talk am, are, is, just you can just say it is B, or car, cars, cars, different thing would be car. So if you have a sentence like this, the boys' uh, cars are different colors. It would be the boy car be different color. This is important. Why? For example, this type of, uh, we talk about documents and we talk about this way that we could represent these documents by um, vectors. Uh, however, uh, the catch is that uh, you need to first parse these documents and you need to resolve some of this. For example, if a document appears car and the other one cars, these are actually similar to each other. In that sense, uh, you may want to uh, find as actually the roots of these things. And then when you have the roots, then you will create these kinds of the vectors out of it. That would be better way of uh, essentially more precise way for similarities between documents. Uh, another thing is the uh, morphology or uh, uh, morphemes. This is the small meaningful units that make up the words. So essentially you will consider a word and you try to chop it off into a small thing. So it is a stem, which is the core or root of it or the affixes. Uh, so these are something that they are essentially uh, attaching to the root. And these are generally gra uh, grammatical functions. Uh, so in the stemming, we try to, this is another thing that we are doing. We try to reduce the terms to their stems in the uh, such that we can get a better understanding out of it. Uh, this is language dependent that would be different. And uh, generally, uh, we try to get the things, try to just reduce the. Mm, so, in some sense, you can consider stemming and lemmatizations together. You may consider this one, just chop it off the affixes and just keep the actual one. For example, here we have it. For, for example, compress and compression, we can have it, for example, compress and compress uh, are both accept or both are both accept as individual uh, equivalent, as equal to compass. Then maybe instead of R, you may want to also replace it with B. Or I don't know, for equal, you may want to replace it with the root of that. So you may do combination of that. So these are some kinds of pre-processing. You will get this text. You need to understand it <clears throat> and make sure that you will simplify, go to the roots, remove them such that <clears throat> those words which are really similar to each other, you first make them similar. These are some of the things that the vector cannot do that. Yes, we are doing the math. But math has some limitations. These are the parts that, I mean, actually we can do it much easier. We can have some rule-based algorithms to do that. When we do that, then we will give it to math vectorization. Then we get much better results. <clears throat> Another thing is this uh, minimum edit distance that we talked about it. Some of these words in this document might be misspelled. And uh, generally you want to find these misspellings and find it with the correct sentence correct words there. So this is, as we discussed, this edit distance is to find 
consider two strings and see how much they are similar. And this is the minimum number of uh, insertion, deletions, or uh, replacement that you can do it to change one word to another, from one string to another string. We talked about it before. So edit distance is especially good uh, for spell corrections. Uh, as long as well as, for example, some have application in information extraction and speech recognition. Speech recognition also, I say some words, maybe uh, a standard way of saying this word might be different. So there should be some edit distance between the thing that I'm getting it, I'm mentioning it and the computer understand it to some, uh, so the computer may try to understand my word, but maybe not correctly, cannot write it in the correct, uh, form, but then it used the minimum edit distance. See, okay, this word is similar to which other word in the dictionary. There we are using edit distance. And then say, oh, he actually meant this word, but he misspelled it maybe like this. And that's the thing that the computer can do that. <clears throat> uh, so these are the edit distance is another useful thing. Again, these are all pre-processing that we are doing it before giving uh, this uh, making this document ready for math or vectorizations, essentially. Another thing that we are doing is the part of a speech tagging. So this is like, a, this is a very complicated version of that. I mean, what type of verb is that? The base, base form, past tense, or this one? Uh, and what type of adjective is that? Several of this one. And these are the special form. These are some standard version. It is called part of a speech tagging. So in general, as I mentioned, you, this is, you want to say that you will see these words. And uh, this is the simplest for version, a universal simplified tag set that essentially it has adjective, uh, I mean, Add position, add verbs, et cetera, conjunction, et cetera. This is maybe uh, easier. Again, what do we do here? Uh, so for example, uh, uh, this is important that uh, this is uh, also important. So we will find uh, two words. First, we are getting this one. For example, uh, uh, I go, you went. So these are two documents that we have. And again, go and went, both of them are coming essentially from the root go. I'm not the best in getting the stems, but say both of them are going from the root go. So here, but the go is the present and went is the past thing. So when you want to say represent these documents, I will say go. I, I, first, I need to get the stems and everything because go and went are not similar at all. I need to make this one, make do this pre-processing such that I know that go and went are the similar things. So then I understand go and go. So I say that this is the go and go. And then, okay, this one has one go and this one has one go in it, in the vector. However, this one is the past sentence. This is the present. And this is past. So if there was another document that in which go is coming, or like say goes is coming. So in that case, it means that this, this is the third document, she goes, this is the third one. So in some sense, this go, we have go, went and goes. In some sense, goes and go are much similar. All of them have all these three documents, they have one go in it. But it seems that the document one and uh, three are more similar because both are present. So what do we do this? So we know that both of them, all of them are uh, essentially uh, verbs, but this is the present, this is the present, and this is the present, and this is the past. Maybe we will multiply these uh, things when we want to compare these two guys. We have another things that it is not completely go, but uh, for example, if it is just the, uh, present, we just multiply it by one. But if it is a past, I will multiply it by 0 0.9 or maybe 0 0.8. And this one, it is go and not goes. Maybe this one, I will multiply it by 0 0.9. So these are the POS, uh, part of speech things. That to all of them have go. One has in the present form, present form, I have the weight of one. 
But for the past one, I am using the weight of 0 0.8. Finally, I have the last one, which is uh, this last one is actually in the uh, form of, it is both of them are present, but this is like the, I don't know, go and goes are still not exactly the same. So I have the weight of 0 0.9 or maybe 0 0.99. So this uh, pose stuff can be multiplied by these vectors, the same way that we have multiplied it by this IDF. So that would be one, but here this one actually becomes 0 0.8 times one. So these are not completely go, is somehow similar to go. And again, so these poles also are important to get these uh, things there. And now the question is that, how can we even find this pose tagging? Pose tagging again, seems maybe is easy for humans, but this is not trivial. If you consider the, the brown corpus, 11% of the word types are ambiguous with regard to part of a speech. We don't know whether it is verb or adverb or what, or noun. These are some examples that they are actually means for that they mean differently. But uh, uh, it is interesting that these thoses, these are ambiguous. They happen for very common words. That is interesting because if you remember, we had this idea that the common words, their weight should be less. So maybe we cannot get it exactly, but anyhow, the weight of these guys are important. If the appears in the text, we don't understand it or that appears and we don't know whether this that is exactly what, maybe it's not that important because that itself is a common word, appears everything. It's not a special word that give us something for the properties. And this is happens for this brown corpus, but in the, in general, in other texts, it can be up to 40% of the word tokens can be ambiguous. So this is a bit larger things that we may care more about it. But again, this is not a trivial thing to do that. Uh, good. So uh, there are two... Uh, uh, particular softwares that you may want to use it in Python for packages. It, so all of these things that we have mentioned about tokenization, I mean, getting the stems, et cetera, all of them have been implemented like, uh, and they, there exist such a thing, so especially in Python. So this is this natural language toolkit, NLTK. <clears throat> This started as a research code. Now widely it is used in industry and research. So NLTK is one of them. This is the one NLTK. The other one is Spacey. This is much newer implementation and it is more streamlined. What are the pros and cons? NLTK has more stuff implemented almost anything because it's a research thing. The people have the state of the art implemented, but this is, can be a blessing or the curse because it's just too complicated. SPC is younger and uh, the features are sparse, but these are much faster. In particular, SPC is a very good one, more industry way that the people are using it. So NLTK is more researchy, SPC is a more uh, industrial way of if you want to use it in industry. Both of them are Anaconda packages. So if you implement, if you download Anaconda, both of them should be there. This is just some examples. So regarding the how fast essentially, shorter is better. So this is NLTK versus SPACI. So for word tokenization, actually you see that SPACI is very fast comparing to word tokenization. For sentence tokenizations, in this case, actually interestingly, uh, in this NLTK is faster than uh, this SPACI. However, if you say this part of a speech tagging, the one that we just talked about it, whether this is a word, this is an adverb, this is a noun, et cetera, in that case, as you will see, a spacey is much, much faster than the NLTK. But both of them are good. I think uh, it would be good to uh, um, download uh, both of them. Like my son actually has uh, <laughs> downloaded this and played with it, with the NLTK. You can get both of them and play with it, that's a very useful thing to have it. All of this algorithm, this is thing, you don't need to implement it. I mentioned that what are, why these problems are hard and this is the case and what are the meaning of that, but you can just use the one that a state of the art that has been implemented. Uh, 
good. So one other, uh, this is another things about engrams and language models. That's another things that I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about it. So what is the engram? That's actually a very, again, important one in uh, lots of things that we will talk about it. So engram is a continuous sequence of N tokens or words. So you, you have essentially, you have done the tokenization. Now consider contiguous uh, sequence of N tokens and words. For example, if your sample sequence is like this, then the one gram sequence would be just take essentially uh, this one sys, each of them would be each of them would be just one thing. This is the unigram or one gram. If you want to consider two grams, the two grams would be two of them together, uh, sys and glee. Then the other one was the glee and Louis. The second one, and Liu and Sir, and Sir and Tar. So this is the, so these are the things. There's two grams, and finally there are, these are the three grams. The three grams are just take any three of them again continuous one, and you can just see that. So this can be defined for different uh, sample sequences. So n grams is like that. What is the language modeling? So these n grams have a uh, lots of other applications. So uh, generally, uh, so what is the idea about n-grams? The idea is that maybe just one word by itself does not give us, one word in a document does not give us that, in, that much information. However, if you consider two words that are coming one after the other, again, we are doing after all parsing, tokenization, getting a stem, et cetera. If you consider two words, and for each two words, we will consider create a new word, that new token that has two words, then that gives us better uh, things for similarities. The, the, uh, uh, so that's the process that if you can do it, you may get more meaning. The, uh, the cons is that then of course it becomes more complicated. If you have 10,000 words in the dictionary, if you want to consider two grams, two grams would be 1,000 times 1,000, sorry, 10,000 times 10,000 which would be a much larger number if you want to do the processing. So it might be uh, somehow uh, a slower algorithm. All of this is like, this is the idea of that precision versus how fast is it? You may do get something very precise, but it, you may never get it during your lifetime, the algorithm. So always you want to get something reasonable in a short time. And the trade-off between time and precision is the one that is important. So n-grams are important in that sense. They are also important for language modeling. <clears throat> what is language modeling? We are assigning a probability to a sequence. That is the idea that any sequence that I have it, I want to give it a probability, whether how correct is this, this sentence or uh, if I generate such a sentence, uh, it means that whether it is how, like what is its distance to be correct sentence. So for example, you may have this one, uh, the uh, probability of high winds tonight versus large winds tonight. So high is the correct things comparing to large. So if somebody, if some system essentially gives you this sentence to you, the probability that you will assign to this should be larger than that. This is for machine, uh, uh, this is, uh, this is, has lots of application. For machine translation, this has a, this application. For spell correction, uh, uh, so you can say uh, the office is about 15 minutes from my house. Now, probability about 15 minutes from should be larger than probability about 15 minutes from. Because why? Because this is not the correct spelling. So this is the correct spelling, so probability of this should be better. So it should be for, for, SP, um, for a spell uh, correction. Uh, for a speech recognition, for example, you say probability I saw a van, that should be much, much larger than PIs out of N. So this is, uh, this is exactly the one that I mentioned. So when I talk, maybe computer understands this one. Then from this one, it first uh, try to get it using that edit distance to find the correct words. And these are the correct, these are the, like say, 
you use edit distance and it finds this type of uh, words out of it. So instead of I saw, it should be eyes out. And these are correct words. So that's a thing, but the probability of this should be much better than this one. So this, uh, this kind of language modeling that you try to give the probability of correctness to each sentence, that has lots of uh, usefulness. I mean, it's very useful in lots of these applications, as well as the summarization, question answering, etc. cetera. Uh, here, uh, I mean, there are two ways essentially for the language modeling. One is that you are computing, one goal is this one, compute the probability of a sentence or a sequence of words. For example, the probability of a word W is, uh, you may want to say the probability of that is, uh, is essentially probability of the a sequence, W1, W2, W3 to this one. This is very similar to n-gram that we talk about it. Another related task is this one. What is the probability of an upcoming word? So what's the meaning of that? It means that what is the probability that W5, if you have a sentence, uh, if W1, W2, W3, and W4 appears, what is the probability that W5 appears after that? This, uh, uh, any model that can compute either of these, either say that what is the probability that this W1, W2, this sequence of W1 to WN is coming, or the one that says that what is the chance that WN comes out of this? These are the ones that we talk about the probability, essentially. This is conditional probability in some sense. Uh, this is, uh, it, so this, the people consider both of them as a language model, uh, as the probability of the whole sentence appears, this whole sequence, or probability that one word WN appears conditioned on the fact that W1, W2, WN minus one appear. This is called language model. There is a lot of research on that one. We don't want to talk much about it. Uh, just, I mean, give some simplest case uh, analysis. So this is, uh, like if you want to just design some very simple language model, one, it is the unigram model. What is the unigram model? Say that the probability, so as I, as I mentioned here, this you need to say, both of them, what is the probability of W, which is the probability of these things? So one thing is that consider all of them independent. Uh, what's the meaning of that? It means that the probability of W1, W2 to WN is equal to uh, pi of, i equal to one to n, p of wi. For each of these guy, compute the p of these guys and then multiply all of them. This is somehow independent version. So it means that if w1 comes after w2, then there is no correlation between them. Of course, this is not a correct thing. There is a correlation. That is the reason that this other model that we talk about somehow conditional things that is based on the correlations between W1 to WN minus one and WN. So if you have such a model, then if you want to generate some sentences out of this, it would be something like this, fifths and this is like completely nonsense <laughs> set of sentences that generate. Uh, another one, uh, which is, uh, uh, this is actually, this is called a, a bigram model. So this one was the unigram model. Just make everything independent. This is the bigram model. This is condition on the previous words. Uh, this is uh, like, uh, why we call it bigram? Because here we have, we have this one that uh, we say, so this is, we define for this other model of things. We say that the probability of WI conditioned on W1, W2 to WI minus one is almost equal to probability of WI based on just the precedent, just the word before. So I don't care about the others. The probability is almost equal to probability of WI conditioned on WI minus one. So um, as you can see here, so this, uh, this is another one. I mean, this is a bit better than the previous one because the previous one exactly ignores this dependence or relate correlation between a word and the word just before that. 
Here, actually, we are just considering the word before that, and we understand that. So in this case, for example, uh, if you see this one, this is a sentence that you may get it. This is like a sentence that is generated using this model. As you will see, that actually makes a, a, the sentence is a bit better than the previous one because it considers some correlation. It's still not the best things. <clears throat> Uh, the people have also considered this kind of the bigram model. Instead of just considering just the word before, maybe you will say that this is equal uh, to probability of WI condition WI minus one and WI minus two. Just a few things before. And this is again bigram because here you just consider two words. Here we consider three, uh, three grams or four grams and others. And the result becomes a bit better for this is. Uh, one application of this kind of language model is that you can generate some sentences out of these uh, languages if you have the model, if you know these probabilities. If you consider four gram, five gram, it becomes better. But the issue is that in general, for languages uh, are this kind of four gram, five grams are not enough. This is the concept that in, in uh, when you consider uh, languages, the languages have long distance dependencies. What is the meaning of that? Here, when we talk about the computer, which I had just put into the machine room on the fifth floor crashed. When we talk about crashed, actually we are not talking about floor, fifth, the, on room. So if you consider four gram, five gram, et cetera, it doesn't mean anything. The crash actually goes to this computer. So very early on. So of course, I mean, uh, it uh, maybe fifth floor, if you consider fifth and uh, the fifth and floor are very correlated, but in this case, crash is not that much related to floor or other things. This is one thing that it is called for languages. It is called long distance dependency. There are uh, some particular uh, neural nets, deep nets. I will talk a little bit about the deep nets today. It, it is, they are called LSTM, long short term memory. These are some particular uh, deep nets that are designed, you can search to know more about them. These are deep nets that are designed exactly for this one because for uh, uh, natural language processing, sometimes these dependencies are local, just like essentially the short distance. Sometimes it is very large distance. And in some sense, we need to have both of them. Interestingly, lots of these uh, neural nets are designed first for natural language processing. And actually that was one of the main success. And because of there are some models that have been designed, like for example, LSTM for natural language processing that later it has been used for other applications. For example, these have applications in stock uh, predictions. Some of you would wanted to do the project on this one. LSTM is one thing that the people have used it to get the um, stock price prediction of a particular company. But anyhow, so these are about the n-gram models, and we talk about it like two grams, three grams, as I mentioned. In some sense, when you consider two grams, three grams, etc., you are getting more correlation between the words, and you may get better results. The only problem is that the, the size of the number of words, if the number of words in a dictionary is 10,000, then it becomes 10,000 to the two or 10,000 to the three or so on, which is very large. We talk about this information extraction, information retrieval, uh, retrieval before, uh, and yes. So here, the things that I wanted to talk, I want to talk a little bit, we talk about LSTM and these deep nets. Here, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, this uh, advanced NLP approaches, especially word to vec which comes uh, through neural networks. And I want to talk a little bit about it and talk about this word to vec So far, we talk how we can, this is one way to change the documents into words, into vectors. But there are other ways. And one other way is actually comes from the, this kind of breakthrough result that has been obtained for words. How can we represent words by vectors? And then out of it, lots of other things comes out of it. Like, 
Doc to Vec, Graph to Vec, Product to Vec, etc. I will talk about them uh, briefly, give some introduction to you here. So I think it is a 753. Um, uh, let's. Uh, great. So, uh, neural nets. So, neural nets actually are taking over. Interestingly, uh, as I mentioned, uh, neural nets have been designed, I mean, they have a very long history. However, uh, and we will talk what are they, but uh, they call it neural nets or deep nets, essentially. These are the same thing. I will say what's the meaning of the deep nets. Uh, they have been there, uh, I mean, for a long time. But one of the, uh, around, I think it was around 2010 or something like this, they had a great success for, uh, for NLP tasks. Some of these tasks that we had it, they had it actually great uh, things like, for example, a speech recognition. They had a great uh, success there. And since then, they became like, again, uh, like much more popular. And nowadays, almost everywhere, uh, these are like some of the major trust areas in pattern recognition, prediction, analysis problems. And uh, for many problems, uh, they have established the state of the art, and it means that they are exceeding the previous benchmark by a large margin. Not everywhere, but there are lots of places. So some of these places, for example, about optimization, etc., other approaches like XGBoot, like decision tree type of things or boosting thing, they are good, like GMB. In practice, they are good, especially for NLPs and uh, uh, pattern recognition and image processing, they are uh, very useful and they got very good results. Uh, however, there are some simpler version that has been used for other type of industry. And I will talk about that, it is worth to make. Uh, here, there are some huge success. They had it about image segmentation and image, uh, they had it, uh, image segmentation and image recognition in AlphaGo. And uh, AlphaGo is the way actually essentially that plays Go. And uh, this is uh, uh, using a reinforcement, deep reinforcement learning to do that. And this is a variety of other problems from art to astronomy to healthcare, and even predicting a stock market. This one, especially that I mentioned about LSTM, way that is very useful. Now, what is a, a neural net? A neural net, generally it has some input layer and some output layers. And each of them, these are the nodes that we have it. This is the input layer, output layer, and this is the hidden layer. We will call it a deep net if the number of hidden layers is just like, like a bit, uh, like, I don't know, five or even more than that. And if it's just one, maybe it is a neural net, but not a deep net. Good. And uh, this is, a, you can consider all this, is, uh, this is a graph that we talked about graphs, a directed graph that all the edges goes from uh, left to right. So that's a neural net or a deep neural net in some sense. Now, uh, what is each node? So consider each node here, what does it do? For example, here, consider this node. This node is generally doing some simple operations. It considers the input that is coming to this guy. So this is, for example, here, if, if this is, say if this is one node, consider all the inputs that are coming. And these inputs are x1, x2, and xn. Then on each edge, it has some numbers, W1, W2, Wn. These are very important. These are the weights that are important. And in some sense, these are the, uh, the way that a neural nets try to uh, understand it. So it considers W1, W2, Wn, then multiplies, for example, this is a typical thing that is doing that, just multiplying this one, these numbers, x1 times w1, x2, w2, these are, uh, again, uh, these w1, w2, wn are very important. It uh, multiplies that, then it takes some f function. f function, for example, it is uh, uh, 
these are the different things. For example, it is something like a ReLU that what is the ReLU is essentially takes the, uh, take a, a, the, a, 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 like it would be the a mean of zero and this function. So that would be some function like this. Actually, uh, yeah, so it's, sorry, it would be the, yeah. It is the same thing is doing. It's taking the max of zero and this uh, sum. So this is this is a particular f that is used a lot. It is called relu. There are some other things like tan and other things as well. Uh, but and sigmoid. This one, the relu one, is the very useful one. So it's very simple function. It just considers this sum. If this sum is less than zero, it just reports zero. If it is greater than zero, then reports this sum. And that would be the yi. So this yi is going to the next layer and is doing that. So here, this is like you can see that. So this yi, so this is the i, it is coming there, this wi. This uh, j computes this one, this f guys like for example, consider the ReLU, and then it computes this uh, YJ, and this YJ is going next one times WJ, goes to the next level and so on and so forth. Generally at the end, uh, we have uh, some, uh, it can be, uh, this can be a sigmoid function at the last layer or softmax. So sigmoid or softmax. that gives the results, uh, the final results. Now, uh, how you can think the whole, uh, the whole things, you can uh, uh, think about this one, that in the input layer, you are giving some input. Uh, so how you can consider this one as a machine learning model. So you can see very simple version. What is a simple version? Is that you are giving the features to this, to this, so this is the one feature, this is the second feature, this is the third feature. These are like the columns of the database that you will give it to this network. And then for example, in the classification at the end, so if it is like Sigma, you can say, do you have just one output? What is this output? Is it is zero or one? For example, uh, uh, if you consider this thing that we have uh, discussed about the, uh, is this written by Beatles or not? You, you may decide to give the, this, uh, uh, like the vector as the input, the vector of the words uh, that you have it using this vectorization approach that we have mentioned for the document. And at the end, it should say zero or one. Zero means, uh, uh, or it can give per, some probability between zero and ones, and you will decide whether this should be zero or one yourself. This should give, like, say, what is the probability between zero and one? It is written by Beatles. So that's essentially the work of, uh, and this can be anything. It can be, we talk about these are the vector that we talk about it, but it can be any features. And this the output should be zero, one. We say whether it is true or false for classification and others. And there are uh, lots of, complicated ways of essentially this kind of neural nets. But just the fact that you will understand that how does it work, that you are giving the input. Now, how do we train it? The train is, in, is important. As I mentioned, we are giving, for example, x1, y1. For the, this is for supervised learning, x2, y2, and so on and so forth. And then uh, x, uh, n, y, n. These are the label data that we will give it. So we will give these labels to this to these networks. And the interesting thing is that when we give it, we train it. This is a special training for this one. It used some kind of technique called back propagations. You don't need to know the details. All of them are already implemented. So you can just use this model essentially for training. Uh, and when you create such a things in Python, you will say, okay, I want to have a, a deep net, how many layers, what is the input layer, what is the output layer, how, how many hidden layers I have, and what is the function that is defined on each layer. You can define it. And there are some approaches that they are uh, doing that. So when you train this one, when you give x1, x2, xn to these things, it trains it. What's the meaning of trains? It means it finds these weights for you. 
it finds the best way. In some sense, you can consider it as a linear regression. You, it finds, you will give all this data to this such that it finds the best W1, W, all these Ws, such that it is consistent with your input data. Good. It is, in that sense, it's very similar to linear regression. You will give it such that you will find these weights, all these weights. Uh, it, this is essentially, as I mentioned, by back provocations or other approaches, it essentially trains this one. But training this means that you will give all this your inputs to this such that it finds the best W1, W2, Wn that like essentially matches your input with the output for the re for because the supervised learning for the data that you have give it to that such that it really when you give x1 it gives some solution close to y1 when you give x2 give some solution close to y2 now when you trained it now if the new instance i don't know x prime is coming x prime i is coming then you will give it to the network then it and for this one say this is the test part we don't so we don't give it what is the y prime so then we it produce some y prime for you and then it, there is might be some real y i that you know for some of them and then you will see the difference between y prime i and y i and you try to minimize that so you essentially you will do that and then you will give to the test and you will, this is like the prediction. For example, I'm giving it, I have all this data from the past days, I'm giving it now for tomorrow. I will give the data that I have it for tomorrow and it gives me these predictions. And then after the tomorrow night, I can see what was the real data that came and just find the distance between them. This can be essentially the uh, <clears throat> absolute value distance or it can be L1 norms or L2 norms. L1 norms would be yi minus y prime i, absolute value of that, or L2 norms, which would be yi uh, minus uh, y prime i, the whole thing's to the two, essentially. This is L2 norm. Uh, actually, you may, uh, you can just consider this one or just also take the uh, square root of that. So that's essentially a deep net or a neural net. Is there any question here? Good. So you can read more about them. There are lots of data on that one, but I think that gives, should give you some idea that how does, as I mentioned, the deep net is very similar in that sense, a linear regression that you may do it and you will just find some of the weights and it just finds the weights. Just it is a bit more complicated. <clears throat> It comes from a network. Now, uh, one thing which is very important here, it is called an uh, autoencoder. What is an uh, autoencoder? As I mentioned, these deep nets have lots of applications. One of the applications that they have it is to, it is essentially for uh, compression. Or when you want to get a compressed knowledge of representation of the original input. So uh, you want to, you can use neural nets for the task of representation learning. What's the meaning of that? I mentioned, for example, that you are giving some vector to this input or any other features. You want to, from these inputs that you are giving to this, you may want to learn some. Uh, compressed vector. So from the input that we have it, we want to find a compressed vector. This vector, this compressed vector would be some kind of representation of the input, the big input that you are giving to this. This is the one, it is called a autoencoder. I mean, they have a different name, but the idea is simple. So uh, in the, uh, how do you do that? You generally, this is the encoder and decoder, but this is, I mean, you have some kinds of uh, symmetric, uh, often symmetric uh, 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 neural nets. So uh, 
what does it do? An autoencoder. It essentially gives you give the input. It compress for you in some much smaller form. The input might be very large, but it compress for you with a much smaller uh, dimensions. Again, this is some kind of vectorization. So any vector in some sense you are giving to this or any input you are giving to it, it produces some vectors for you. So what are these vectors actually? So generally the, this is the case that for these nodes in the middle guys, it can be just one layer even. You have input, output, and one layer. Sometimes you have more than one layer. So this guy, generally the number of uh, uh, nodes in this middle guy is the minimum much smaller than the input. And then uh, what is the good things? So what are these vectors? These vectors that it represents this, actually these WIs that are coming to these guys. So I mentioned that uh, this, to each of these nodes, some WIs are coming. These WIs, this matrix WI, these are the one actually that they form these compressed forms. So when you make the number of nodes here small, then you are making that the, these WIs that are coming to this, the, it is a matrix essentially. You can consider it as a matrix multiplication. The dimension of this matrix becomes a small. And that's the way that now in some sense, any data that you will give it to it. So uh, uh, what do we do? Uh, we are doing exactly the previous task for the training. We will give it different. So we will give the first X1, Y1 to this, then X2, Y2 and so on and so forth. We will give it, as I mentioned, this is the training step. When it trains the whole system, what will happen when it trains the whole system, it computes the best WIs that somehow, as a, you can consider the linear regression that if I give this input, it gives you this output. And then computes the best WIs, which are the coefficients of the nodes that are coming to this middle layer, the code layer. Then what do we do in the auto? So before we were using this uh, machine learning essentially to uh, infer if I give some kinds of X prime I, what would be the output of that? Here, this is another application. And they have, uh, this have several applications, but one important application is that when we train this network, then we will forget about everything that we have done it here. We will forget about it. Only this WIs is the one that we care and we will save it. What do we say? We say that this input that I have given to you, this imp for any input, I compute some WIs for you. These WIs are representation of the, the succinct representation of your input. Good. In some sense, this is again the same idea of vectorization. I'm giving any data to this, and then at the end, uh, I will get some codes. This code is exactly this WIs, these vectors that I'm essentially getting it, and this vector would be representation of my input. This has applications in lots of other places, like uh, anomaly detection, uh, data denoising, for example, for images, audio or information retrieval. But one important one is the embedding or data compressions or vectorization. So we will use this one for uh, this uh, vectorization. So uh, uh, that's the one uh, important things application. And then that's the one that I want to use it. So uh, autoencoders essentially train uh, things, but they are, uh, after this one, I will forget, I will just discard everything that has computed, except these WIs, which are the coefficients of this middle layer. And these are the one that I'm using it to represent my input. <coughs> Good. So, uh, and uh, also one other thing, which is uh, used a lot in, uh, machine learning especially, it is called one-hot encoding. So uh, what is, what's the meaning of one-hot encoding? In general, it means that if you have, a, so say for example, your input, uh, you, this is the one input column. So if one input columns, say for example, uh, 
uh, I don't know. Say, for example, this is a fruit. I don't know, for some, some. So for example, this one says apple. This one say orange. Uh, I don't know, the other one is banana. So uh, the issue is that how can I input this guy into this input? The way that generally it is created, this is called one hot encoding. The way that is done, I will bring it here. The way it would be like this. So I create one. Uh, so from this one column here in my database that I had it, this is the feature. For this feature, I create maybe if there are like the number of uh, here, say for now is three, maybe it is more than that. But say any number of uh, uh, fruits that appear here in total, say in this case is three, but it can be more than that. For each of them, I create its own uh, its own vector, its own column, apple, orange, and banana. Good. Now, uh, so in that case, if one guy is has apple, I will just put for this one, if one row has apple, I will put it apple, this one. The all other things would be zero. If the other row had orange, then I will put it orange here and all of them zero. This is something which is called one hot encoding. You can just search about it and do that. In some sense, when we have such kind of things, we represent this one with the vectors. Now, note that each of these, so here, these columns would be one of these XIs that I want to give it to here. Uh, however, uh, the, the issue is that I cannot give this one to that because this is like this one. But here I create instead of one input to this, I now I have three inputs to this deep net, for example. One, uh, one input for this, this is like this one is for apple, this one is for orange, and this one is for banana. So if for one item, if for one row, if the apple is one, then I will put it one, zero, zero. I will give it to this net when I try to train it or when I try to infer something. If the other one is like it is, uh, this one is has only one, this would be zero, one, zero, and so on and so forth. So this is called one hot encoding that if it, this, you may use it actually uh, in your machine learning, uh, algorithm in the prediction. Uh, generally, it is very important to do one hot encoding for this kind of categorical things, or uh, sometime even for the numbers, you can also do this kind of one hot encoding. You can just read about it, what are the applications of one hot encoding. But when, uh, if you don't do one hot encoding, the system does not understand it quite well. One hot encoding generally means that if the column has several instances, just make it new columns for each of them, and each element here can be zero, one. This is a vector, and this vector, you can now give it as an input to this one, to this. So these are some of the techniques that I have mentioned. Now I want to go and come back to the NLP and talk about the uh, word to vec, which is a very important thing. So uh, this is about the word embedding. We talk about a document to vectors, as I mentioned, uh, for documents, we are doing some pre-processing. After the pre-processing, all this stemming, et cetera, uh, point of speech, et cetera, then we are making them some words, some uh, like uh, vector. Here, the idea is that can we do the same thing uh, for the words? Words seems simpler things, but actually this a breakthrough result that has been obtained for this for words later has been used for documents for everything essentially. So I want to describe this one, and there are some good properties of that. So what do we want to do? We need to find. A, a, so we want to define some W that take a word from I mean some context for some for example for some. Uh, uh, corpus that we have. We have a lot of data, a corpus of uh, data. And then from that, we want to learn for each word, what should be the vector that represents this word. And then there are some good properties of this that we will talk about it. Uh, it this will be useful for extra input uh, informational extractions. And even actually this the generalization of this will be for use for 
another way, so this also gives us another way to uh, represent a document as a vector. Okay, let's see what is the things we want to do that. So we want to get, uh, what are the properties? We want to uh, get some relations between words and corresponding vectors. For example, I want to have, as I mentioned, W of a word gives us a, gives me a vector or an array essentially. So W of, uh, I want to have this property. If I, this is a vector that is giving to me W of a woman and all of them have the same dimensions. So I will get the vector of woman minus the vector of man. I want to be, this is somehow the, the amount and these are the two vectors. So this is like the first vector, I, I don't know, maybe if this three dimension is, one, zero, 0 0.5 minus the second vector, which is, I don't know, one, maybe one and 0 0.75. I'm just taking the minus of these two vectors. So the minus would be one minus one would be zero. So the result, this would be equal to zero. Then zero minus one would be minus one and zero seven minus this would be zero minus Good. So this is a vector that I'm getting it. So I want to have this one. That it, so this is the this was the vector for woman. This is the vector for man. And I will just take the difference. I want that this difference somehow equal to almost equal to if I get W of aunt minus W of uncle because that's in some sense the difference between these two cases is, should be the same thing that the woman and man are different. Or I want to get the W of uh, vector of uh, woman minus vector of man is almost equal to uh, W of queen minus W of a king. So these are somehow, th these vectors are the one that are minus vectors. So when you minus this one, that's the vector that we will get it. And these vectors I, somehow should be similar values. So the question is that what should be the uh, size of these uh, vectors that I want to get it? As I mentioned, for example, here, it was only size, the dimensions of that was three. We can actually create uh, higher dimensions, but the issue is that always this is this trade-off in uh, uh, this and other machine learning things. Then if you have uh, larger vectors, then uh, the efficiency will come up, down because then you need to work with larger vectors. Uh, but uh, like uh, at the same time, also overfitting may happen. So it means that it essentially overfitting is the one that uh, uh, they tr the, the, your system try to just understand the noise and not the actual system. So uh, uh, actual data. So generally the word, it has been used different things. So it has been between, in practice, the people have used it, I don't know, maybe between 50 to 300 or 400. That is the size of each vector, the dimensions of each vector that word, word will be used. And how do we find this W? This is, uh, I mean, as we will talk, this can be done using actually neural nets. In particular, autoencoders. Let's see the way that we are doing this. So for word to vec, again, we have a word in a, some kind of a dictionary. And this dictionary is all the words that in a corpus of data are used. So we have a big set of data and words. And for each of them, we want to, I want to represent each word here by a vector. So there are two general approaches. One is the called continuous bag of word or CBO. And the other one is a skip gram. CBOW. Uh, so continuous back of words versus escape gram. So we had back of words, but here is a continuous back of words. This is actually very similar to this kind of n-grams that we have seen. But let's see what, how do they do it. 
both of them are deep nets. So uh, they have the input, they have the output, and they have some projection. This is exactly this kind of uh, autoencoder level that I have mentioned. So in the autoencoder, you can have arbitrary number of uh, actually hidden layers. But here we have only, this is very simple, deep, very simple neural net. We have only one hidden layer. So one hidden layer in both of them. In the CBOW, I'm the input, actually, I'm giving some words before this and some words after that. I will give you the example. And in the escape gram, so uh, what is the idea? In the uh, CBOW, I'm giving the context. Context means some words around this particular word that I have it. And then uh, the output should be this missing words. And then each, this guy should learn, and I will just use the coefficients here to represent any words. Here in the escape gram is different. I will give each word, and the output should be the words that are surrounding this particular word. Let's see an example here. So, uh, so let's go first with the CBOW. Here we have the bag of words ideas. There, we just get use of the order of these guys. In the continuous version, actually, we don't get rid of the order. The order, uh, uh, yeah, the order actually is important as we discuss. To see more details about this, you can actually go to this one and you can uh, take a look at that. Uh, this is a good one that gives you the ideas. But let me. Uh, um, uh, see what is the way that I do that. So, uh, so consider this sentence, for example. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy. Generally, we are having, we are talking a window around each word. For example, if you consider, uh, say consider here, we are considering uh, n equal to one. N equal to one means that consider any word here, consider one word before it and one word after that. This is the window size, so N is window size. So N is the window size, and there are here N is equal to one. N equal to one, it means that consider each word, and see what is the context around it. The context around it means that n words before these words and n words after these words. Good. Now, I need to say for any deep nets, what is the input? I need to train it. How do I train this one? I need to get from this corpus of data some input, some output. So this is so far is just some text like this. From this text, how can I essentially get some input output? This is the way that I do that. So the context word would be your input. And the target word would be the Y value. So I need to say X, Y. Let's see the example here. Here is N equal to one. Consider this sentence. I'm reading this sentence. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Now, I want to generate uh, some uh, X and Y. What do I say? I will consider this first word, uh, for example, first word, da. So I'm saying that this da would be the target word. What is the input? The input would be essentially empty and da. Uh, sorry, this is for the, that would be the and quick. It means that if I give the, in, at the input, so this is the way actually you can do this one with any other machine learning thing. I want to say that, it, and this is somehow, it is like two grams, almost two grams. I will say that if I give empty and the quick, my machine learning model, my ML model should give me the as the output. If I give quick to that, so if I give quick, so what about, uh, so quick, for quick, again, I will give it as an input. 
So what is the input to that would be da, the word before, and brown. That gives you the out. So this should give this one. And then let's say in one more example, brown. For brown, what would be that? So the, for brown would be the output here. And the input should be quick and fox. Good. So I will essentially read this big data and here n is equal to one. n is equal to one means that I only consider one word before one word after. If n is equal to two, I will consider this instead of uh, just uh, uh, instead of the uh, uh, tuple that I have it, it would be a quadruple essentially. Two words before, two words after. So for example, if n is equal to two, then I will give it a brown. So what would be for, for the word brown, it would be like this. Da quick Then the word after fox and jumps. So this is the input. This is the input pair. So you can consider this, this has four columns and this is the things. And the, what should be the output? The output should be the missing word. What is the missing word here is brown. That is for, so in some sense, I will just go through this, this whole big text and I just generate this quadruple here for n equal to two and the output this one. So this is x and y that I will give it as an input and output to this uh, CBOW. This is a neural net. So this we are doing exactly the same thing that I have mentioned. I will read this one. I will generate this training data, which are this quadruple here if n is equal to two and this target value. I will give it and I will train this uh, neural net. When I train this neural net, so this is, as I mentioned, for example, this is just the one that I have mentioned. So if you have the cat sat on the floor, if the word window size is two, then I will give it two word before dog cat is the one thing. And then on floor is the other one. I will give to this guy and then it should, what should be the output? The output should be, the output should be sat. I will train it with all the data that I have it. And what does it, and uh, one other thing, how can I give the input to the and cat? The and cat, I need to do it the one hot encoding as I have mentioned it. So really here, when I want to give the cat, I should have a, a vector, but is the size of this, it would be the dictionary size. What is the dictionary size? Is an old, and see how many words appear in all purpose that I have it, that would be the dimension of that. Then cat would be the one that has only one here. So I'm just uh, do essentially this kind of one hot uh, uh, vector. So I will give it for cat. This is the one that is cat. For on, I will give this one. And at the output also the sat is one word. So that should be the one that comes out. This is the one that I'm giving it to this system. And I just train this one, like this is an auto encoder, as I mentioned, it is auto encoder. So when I train this one, at the end I will, so and is, we have only one hidden layer. What is the dimension of this hidden layer? As I mentioned, the dimension of this can be between 50 to say 400. That is the typical thing that the people are using. In different application can be different. Uh, then I will just forget about this output layer. I have two vectors here. This is the W, uh, this is the matrix. These are these matrix are exactly these Ws that I learned. Actually, there are two matrix, one input one and the one output one. In this case, both of them are interesting. I will call this W and this one is W prime. Both of these matrix that I have it here, they can give me the vectors that, that represent the, the dimensions of that would be these dimensions that they represent each word for me. So 
uh, how can I do that? So there are two ways. So in this uh, uh, CBOW that I'm doing it. So uh, for example, here consider the word fat. I have some, uh, this is, I, for from these guys, I will find some, uh, this W matrix, this is, this W matrix is exactly this coefficient. If I multiply this W matrix times X cat, X cat means that essentially everything is zero except one. That gives me some V cat to me. Then here, uh, what do I get from this guy also, that is the W V N times X on give me some, W on, and then when I take this one, I can take the average of these two vectors. That would be the vector that represent my vector V hat. This is for the word fat. I represent it with like this. I can take this one, this from these two vectors I created, or I can create it just the vector output vector. This there are some coefficients here for the output. I can just take my vector essentially from this W prime. These are some maths you don't, I mean, you can read more about them, but just uh, essentially, uh, I think you should understand that these matrices that we have, when we multiply by this kind of the hot cut, one hot encoding, it gives me a vector of size and dimensions. Then you can maybe take the, the average of this or this one for the output, there is no average. You can just take the output one. So this is the one. So this is the vector that I have it. This is, I multiply it by this one and it gives me a V cat. So V cat, the size of that would be the size of this guy. And then again, I get a V cat plus V on then take the average that would be representation for the word fat. Uh, or I can just take the output. The output is easier because output has only one. Uh, there is only, it goes to one thing. Here I may get it from a few of them. So that's the whole things. And uh, it, so uh, you are, as I mentioned, uh, we are just, we have a deep net and this deep net tries to understand that if cat and on came and cat, what was the cat and on here? Cat was just, so this is say, if n is equal to one, so I want to give it, I should give it cat and on, the output should be sat. So this deep net should understand that whenever I will give cat and on, it should give me sat essentially. So when I will give cat and on, it should give me sat. And then, uh, so I will give cat and on, it should understand it should be sat. The way that the, the last layer, as I mentioned, these are just some function. I mentioned this function relu at some place. This is another one that is used. It is a softmax. I don't want to go through that, but this is some function f that is used. But anyhow, this is the, some network. It has only one hidden layer. The dimension is the dimension that I want to represent each word. I will train this one with the whole uh, corpus of data, as I mentioned, and then you will get some representation from the, this word, either from here by summing it up and average or just by taking the output one. So this is the output vector, and then uh, this uh, this neural net should predict that whenever I will say cat and on, the middle guy, the one that was, so cat and on would be the context that is, so this is the context if cat and on, uh, again, here I wanted to mention that. So here, cat and on, this is also called context. I'm giving the context this one and this should be, should give me the missing word. So the missing word comes out of it, cat and on, and then the, at the result, sat should be there. And for the, I give the context and the words, and I will train this one. And this is the same as the uh, autoencoder that I have mentioned. I can get uh, the vectors essentially. And these vectors, I get essentially two vectors, one input vector, as I mentioned here, I get two vectors, one W, one W prime. W comes from here. Uh, this is the one function. The other one is W prime. I can take any of them. And actually it is interesting. The there are applications that this W and W 
prime play different roles and each of them have their own use. One of these, we have used it actually for some product recommendation at Overstock. I will give you the reference for that. You can read it and understand that what the role of W and W prime is also interesting. Uh, and we can even some people take just W, some people take W prime, some take, people take average of them. But actually, in some uh, this paper that we have it, we show that if you take W and W prime together, you get actually better results. So, uh, uh, for example, if you are using this one, then uh, if you do this embedding, this is the uh, this is originally done by. Uh, Mikolov et al. in 2014, and then uh, they they have obtained these words. They obtained this word, for example, king, queen. This is actually quite amazing that this learns to this one. When you get these vectors, if you put it king minus man plus uh, woman, the result would be queen. So in some sense, we are exactly this property that I have it. it so what is the beauty of this? It without, I mean, so I don't mention the gender or anything to this, but just from this corpus of text, this big amount of text that I'm giving to it, it understands that the relation between man and woman is the same relation that a king and queen have. It is amazing, you see, that I didn't mention, this is the beauty of the uh, neural nets. Some of this, it is very hard to compute, to mention to the computer that what's the relation between <laughs> men, the relation that men and women have it is the same as the one that king and queen have it. For us, it's very easy. But in some sense, we have this all neural net. It's come, somehow came from, motivation came from human beings. The, the belief is that, I mean, we have essentially the brain and the brain in some sense is some kinds of, neural nets. It is not, uh, the, the behavior is a bit different from the behavior that we are using here and somehow we optimize for computers. But this is exactly the same kind of meaning that when I say, what's the, if I say, uh, so this is some kind of test that you can give it. You can say, uh, this is a type of test that you, there are for children or others. You say the relation between man and woman is equivalent to relation of king. And then this guy, it can find the closest ones, oh, queen. It understands the relation without really saying what is this relation. That's the beauty of this that we can do it here. These are the similar things. For example, uh, you can see these vectors, all of them, these are some examples from this, that China and Beijing, Russia and uh, Moscow, if you take this, the, it's the vector of China minus Beijing, Russia minus Moscow, Japan minus Tokyo, all of them almost have the same size and the same essentially, uh, these are all parallel vectors of almost the same size. It is amazing again. It understands the concept of being capital. We thought this is like a child for it. I mean, maybe even for the child you mentioned, what is the meaning of capital? of a country. But here you don't mention it. You just give this big amount of text. You are just producing some training data, context, target, context, target, context, target. You will give it to this neural nets. It takes some time. That takes time to do that. But at the end, it computes these vectors, which are these coefficients that compute for you, and they have these properties, which is amazing. Escape gram uh, is the, another one uh, that uh, uh, escape gram is another one that is also used. Again, you can read this one from this documents that I have mentioned. Uh, so this is an alternative to CBOW. So this is a start with a single word embedding and try to predict the surrounding word. So this is different. So there we had the context and then we want to get the missing word. Here I'm giving the word and then I want to see what is the context. In particular, what is the context? I want to say if I give this word, what are the words which are close to this? So this is exactly that's the reason that is the reverse of that. I'm giving a word, again, one hot encoded, and I expect that it gives me the output, the surrounding words. Interestingly, this one is, works better uh, in practice and scales better. So it is a much better approach uh, in practice 
lots of people are using this one. And again, this is very similar to the one, this is a neural net that I have it. I give one word here. Uh, so what is the input to this one? Uh, I will show you the what are the inputs to this. Okay. So I need to say again, so I have the same type of uh, neural net. This is the input vector that I have it here. Uh, the, again, one hot encoded. This is one hidden layer that I have it. This is just sigma. And this last one, it is uh, output layer is the softmax classifier. You can also read about it. So, and the size of the input and output, both of them are the same size actually here. So the input vector and the output vector, both of them have essentially the same size. Let's see an example here. <clears throat> so again, this is a vector that is already done. You only need to use it. And there are some fast implementation of that. So uh, now, again, I have a big text. From this big text, I need to produce training samples for this guy. How do I do it? It's very similar to the previous guy. I have a window size. The window size here is n is equal to 2. I do the reverse. So here I have the. So who are the guys which are closed within window of 2 of, within radius of 2 of the quick and brown? I will give it this time, I give it actually two separate. The previous one, I will, I should give it, I gave it quick and brown and da. Here I don't do it. I will do it even simpler than that. I will say, I only give it a tuple, uh, 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 essentially a pair actually. Da and quick. So da and quick and da and brown. This is the training sample. What about the next one? Da, quick, brown, fox. I will give it quick and da, I will give it quick and brown, and I will give it quick and fox. What about this one? Then I come to brown. I will give it four one. Brown to da, brown to quick, brown to fox, and brown to jumps. What is this? Essentially, it means that if I give brown, it should give me one word surrounding to that. So these are the training samples. As I mentioned, the input dimension and the output vector are the same here. Out vector are the same. So input output is the same. I will just give it the input. This is the output that I give it after that. And then I will just, again, ask, uh, I mean, some kinds of back propagations or other ways to train this one uh, uh, for this uh, network. And then it learns. How do I get it? This is, again, two vectors. This is one vector. I will get it. And this is the W prime. Again, this is the hidden layer, the dimensions of this. The original one that they have used it was 300 neurons. That means the dimension of this vector that you will get it is 300. 300 is the original paper of this, uh, these guys. Uh, they, in that one, they use 300. But different applications might be different. So you get W and W prime, two vectors. Again, these two vectors, you can use any of them. You can use W, W prime, the average of them, or you can use both of them. Anyhow, so when you are doing, we have the vocabulary of one uh, 10,000 words. The embedding vectors has the 300 features. It is essentially means that the dimensions that I have it. And then the hidden layer is going to represent it by a weight matrix of 1,000 rows. This is the weight matrix. This is this W. These are the coefficients of these guys that are coming. Uh, so uh, in some sense, I have, uh, so I have 300, so you see, I have 300 uh, neurons here, or the nodes here. Each of them gets input from 10,000. <clears> because it gets from all of these uh, input guys. So I have a matrix of uh, 300 times this 10,000, essentially. And then to get a representation of one vector, the input one, you can just consider a vector, which is 0, 0, 0, just 1 and 0. You just multiply this vector. So this is the W. This is the vector that if you want to say this is on. For the word on, this is the W. So this is the one hot encode one hot encoded vector for on. I will multiply this time times W. This is the coefficient matrix. It gives me the vector that I want. That's essentially the idea. You can do this one 
This is the input to this vector. You can get it also from the output. You can get it because the input and output, this is also 1000. You can get another matrix, uh, another representation by doing the output one. Anyhow, so uh, 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 this is the whole intuition for both of them. That if I give, uh, uh, so if I have two words, that the surrounding words around them, the context of these words are similar, it means that these words should be similar. If I'm doing two words, it may come in different contexts, but the context in some sense are similar. It means that these two words should be similar. That's the general idea that is doing that. And it means that if these two words have the similar surrounding, similar context, it, the vector corresponding to this, to this two words should be similar. That's the whole idea that generates for uh, two vectors, like for example, uh, king uh, vector in some sense would be similar to men vector and queen would be similar somehow to woman. That's the idea. Uh, this is the one important thing. All of this thing that I have mentioned, uh, you can, uh, if you want to do it, like especially a skip gram. So you have uh, 10,000 word, 300 uh, dimensions and gives a very large uh, space to learn. And these 10K words, there are some applications that are many more words than this one. So the training can take actually a lot of time. However, everything that I have mentioned, you can just use this one. This is the state of the art. This is called fast text. You can just go there. This is originally designed by Facebook. Now it is open source. All of this embedding, you only need to learn to use this fast text, which is very easy. You can just use that one to get this embedding. You don't need, and it optimizes all the parameters for you. is very fast, etc. cetera. Uh, here, I mean, there are some kinds of uh, work to make uh, improvements. So uh, I'm just saying briefly that there are uh, some of these uh, good things that you can do it. So one thing is that uh, common words uh, or pairs, uh, uh, Sometimes it would be better. For example, here, if you have the Boston glob, Boston glob is different from Boston and glob. So you may consider two grams to get a better embedding for this word. And the issue is that the size of this becomes larger, the size of the dictionary, the training, but it can get more precise. Uh, so it, essentially that is the whole idea that for phrases, don't for Boston glob, use a new frame. So uh, Boston is one word, glob is one word, and Boston glob is one word. Like San Francisco is just one word. If you do all of them, you get a better result. Another thing that has been used is the subsampling. The idea is that this, this is the same thing that we discussed. The, these words that appear a lot, for example, the or something, these are or that, these are the things that they are not giving that much meaning to us. You actually may want to remove some of these guys. You try to get use, understand more from uncommon words. Da and that appears everywhere in this text. So in that case, you will cut the words with probability related to the words frequency. So those, you don't completely remove them, but some of these words that they appear, if the word appears too much, there's a good chance that this word disappears. So now whenever you will consider the window of size 10, if the word da is removed, then you don't uh, need to consider this da in the, especially this one it would be useful for escape gram. That another one that improves the things. Another thing is that is negative sampling. Negative sampling is that uh, this, uh, things that we are giving, uh, as I mentioned. So when you give some input, the output generally would be something like this. You expect that if I give this input, the output is just one of them is one. All others are zero. But if you want to give this one for a training, so if we have the dimension of this output was something like 10,000 then it takes a lot of time to actually compute this uh, 10,000 and make sure that only one is one, everything is, else is zero. This is something that is called negative sampling. You don't need to actually make sure that everything else is zero. Only you need to select maybe five or six out of this 10,000 and make sure, make sure that this guy becomes one 
and these others become zero. These are these five to six guys are called negative sampling. So negative sampling. Again, interesting thing about negative sampling, you don't need to that much deal with it. All of this fast texting that I have mentioned, it handles it. And this is one way that actually uh, make sure that uh, these things, uh, uh, I think somebody mentioned it. Like, yeah, I will just finish uh, soon. Good. Yes, uh, I need to uh, finish this one. And uh, yeah, so when you do this uh, input output things, then you just want to make sure that uh, only uh, one guy is one, everything, just only five other six are zero. That improves the uh, training time a lot. That's another thing that is mentioned also in the original work. And finally, this uh, embedding word to VIC embedding has lots of applications. It is a secret source for lots of applications like in NLP type of things like entity recognition, uh, part of a speech tagging, parsing, etc. Not only it has applications here, it has also applications at transfer learning, I don't want to, I don't have time to mention it and it is beyond this class. So you can just, it has lots of applications for other things. You may learn something and for, this is the transfer learning is interesting. You may learn these vectors for one task and then may use it for totally different tasks and still you get a good result. It has uh, applications on lots of other things, especially these are some of them for uh, recommendation systems. So the recommendation systems uh, are the, uh, yeah, this is like the last two slides. So uh, this is, a, it has a lots of application recommendation system. One particular application, as I mentioned, when you go to Amazon, you will see some item, I don't know, some book, for example, and it suggests to you some other related books or some uh, essentially a sponsored book. All of these books are based in this concept of word to vec what is the, this is exactly the same idea in some sense it understand that it it embeds the same thing it here instead of embedding the words it embeds the books into vectors and then finds similar books based on the those vectors that the this the distance between those guys this the vector of this book and vector of this book has the like minimum distance it suggest those to you or recommend that to you. There are several applications, for example, uh, one, it is called product to VEC, node to VEC, graph to VEC. This product to VEC is the one that is used for Amazon, for example, as I mentioned. Uh, finally, this is a recent paper that we have it. This is that overstock if you have bought something. We have used this one, as I mentioned, we use both the W1 and W2 in this case to get a very nice concept of complementary detection. You can read the paper if you want. It's a very recent paper and it exactly explains how you can do it, how you can implement it. That's actually a good paper. This is all paper, you can read it. And finally, this is also, you can do it more than that. Not only this, you can not only embed the words, but you can actually uh, get some word <laughs> embedding for the words. You can get some image embedding this is also, you can get it. And then you can combine to get some combined vectors. And this, uh, so in some sense, this kind, this kind of embedding that I have mentioned, you can combine different embeddings. If you have an image of a cat and somehow understand cat from the context, you can have one word for the, one vector for the cat from the context, one word from the images, and then combine it to get a better representation of cat. That's another application. There are lots of research done here. It's a very active area of research. Uh, lots of good things, good results, lots of these things that you see in practice, recommendations, others are coming out of these embeddings. And the whole idea, all of these things that we discussed, documents, words, products, items, graphs, everything can be made it mat in a mathematical way after some pre-processing by embed them into some vectors. And that's the whole idea. That's it. So I think we are done. Uh, so let me uh, stop share. Uh,